Here we are again, and we're back at Proverbs uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, and we're going to look at the second part of verse 8 and also verse 9. And, and I want to tell you before we go on, um, I was just sitting here thinking, this is a great privilege to teach you uh, children. And, and I hope your parents are present. They need to know uh, what you're learning from someone outside your home and outside your church. But it is a great privilege. And you need to understand, I have walked with the Lord a long time, and He is so gracious and so kind. He, he is never the problem. Um, but I wish, as I look back on my life, I had known more of the book of Proverbs and more of Scripture. I wish I had been a wiser and uh, that's what I want for you. Um, not extremes, just wisdom. Wisdom. You know, zeal without knowledge, the Apostle Paul lets us know, is, a, is quite dangerous. I want you to be zealous for the Lord, but I want you to do it with great wisdom. And as a matter of fact, I am really hoping that you do it with a lot more wisdom than, than, than I have done over my life. And that's why I'm doing this. So I'm not trying to, uh, you know, we're not going to talk a lot of big words or not going to be really formal. I just want you to have a great life in Christ. That's, that's the purpose of all this. And uh, to help your parents out a bit. Uh, you know, some of you have just wonderful parents, but struggle maybe a little bit with teaching the Bible. Some of you have just great dads. I mean, they, they are amazing, far beyond anything I'll ever be. But maybe they have a little bit of trouble uh, studying and, and teaching sometime. And so I uh, just want to help out. So uh, let's get started again. Um, we're going to read verses 8 and 9 because I really want to... Um, the, the guys who help me make these films, they say I move too slow. So let's look at uh, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful reef to your head and ornaments about your neck. Now, we looked at the father's instruction, that a father is to be involved teaching their children. And let me say something that just kind of popped up that's important, dads. A lot of times, a father only instructs a, a child because the child has been disobedient. And they're doing some form of, of rebuke and, and correction. And rebuke and correction have their place. But if that's the only time you're teaching your children, uh, that's just not right. It's just not biblical. That we need to teach our children in a positive context, not, not just as a response to something they did wrong. And if they did something wrong, it, yes, it could be their fault. But it also could be the fact that we only teach them when we're rebuking them, and we really don't spend a lot of time investing in their knowledge and their instruction. We really are required to do that. And you know what? There's some great uh, Sunday school teachers out there, but they can't replace a dad and a mom. And there are great pastors and preachers, and like I said, learning in the church has its priority. But that still doesn't replace what must be done in the family. Now, let's go on. He says, hear my son, your father's instruction. And now, so listen. Now he's going to look at it negatively. Do not forsake. He's talking about your mother's teaching. Now, do not forsake it. This word means to leave off, to let alone, to abandon, to neglect. You know, a lot of times, now children, look at me. This is real important. Most of you are not going to look at your parents and say, I don't care what you say. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to be in any Bible study. Or very few children even say, you know, when they get 18 years old, I'm out of the house. I've had enough of your teaching. I am totally walking away from everything. We don't verbalize that. And many times we don't even intend to do that. But, but here's what you have to see. He's not talking about uh, do not tell your mother and father you totally abandon everything they've taught you. It's not what he's saying. That's not really the temptation we have to worry about so much. It does happen, but not that often. Here's the problem. Neglect. 
What does neglect mean? When you just ignore the importance of something and it doesn't have a place in your life anymore. And you know what, kids? I don't have to look at you. I can look in the mirror. And, and remember, oh, there was something the Lord taught me through the scriptures so many years ago, and I have forgotten it. I laid it aside. And, 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 and that is not, that is something that's going to happen, but guard against it in, in the power of the Holy Spirit with the encouragement of, of other believers in Christ. Guard against the neglect of truth. Most of you aren't going to just abandon it, but you'll forget about it. Or think, you know, the, the scriptures are something that, yeah, when I'm in church or I'm in a Bible study, but they go no farther than that. No, they are to order our entire life. So does it include, you know, don't say no to your mother's teaching? Yes. Don't reject your mother's teaching? Yes, it includes that. But it means more than that. Don't be careless with it. Don't forget about it. Don't lay it aside as something that's not important. And maybe I should say something here. You know, in media today and in different things, it, it seems like in every case, the, the, the children are made to appear as the ones who are wise. And the parents, uh, those who really don't know what's going on. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. That children start out as as those who cannot see the complex issues and answer those questions and live according to those answers and that they need instruction. And so I, I want to encourage you kids, listen to me. You need your father's instruction. You need your mother's teaching and you need to listen. You know, so one time someone came to me and, and there were a group of men around me and someone came to me and they began to uh, rebuke me and scold me and, and all sorts of things. And uh, what they were saying was not biblical at all. And when they walked away, a friend of mine said, why do you even listen? And, and the reason is, if, if we get to the point where we no longer think this person has anything to say to me, then we get in a pretty dangerous situation. So if you think that your mother, your father, has nothing to say to you, um, you're probably really wrong. And so he says, don't forsake, don't neglect, don't treat it as old-fashioned. Just because something is old doesn't make it, wrong, make it wrong. And just because something is new and progressive doesn't make it right. What do the scriptures say? Now here's something very interesting that I want you to say, see. It says, do not forsake your mother's teaching. You know what the word is here? Do not forsake your mother's Torah. Your mother's, this word is translated law, and it's the word that is used to translate the law of God, the Torah of God. As a matter of fact, many, many Jews today will still refer to the five books of the law as the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. Or they'll, they'll refer to the Ten Commandments that way. And so, what do I want to point out here? Does your father have authority? Yes. Now, he needs to exercise that authority biblically and lovingly, and not for the sake of himself, but for the sake of his family. But here's what I want you to see. Your mother has authority. Um, in my house, you don't do the following. If, if mother says, uh, you shouldn't do this, or you should do this, uh, the children are not going to say, yeah, that's what you say, but what does dad say? Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, they will get in, in a lot of trouble for doing that. You see, the, the mom has authority over you. Now, again, we've talked about all the other things. She must be biblical, loving, kind, uh, not, not selfish, not manipulative. And yet at the same time, she does have authority, and she should be respected as your mother, okay? So he says, do not forsake your mother's law, your mother's teaching with authority. And, and again, someone always will ask, the, well, what if my mom asked me to do something I shouldn't do? Well, if it's against the law, don't do it. But most of the time, it's, it's not that. Sometimes it is, and you, you must have discernment, and you, you, you need help. 
but most time it's just disagreeing with mom over the way you've been behaving with the other children or the chores that you need to do or the schoolwork you need to do and so on and so forth. In those cases, honor your mother and father, honor God, and, and live in obedience. Now, let's go on. He says here, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful reef to your head and ornaments about your neck. Now, indeed, um, it can be translated the preposition for. But the, the idea here, the thing that's important is that, is that the book of Proverbs teaches us that, that our, the way we respond has consequences. And I want you to see that. You've heard this story, you know, you play with fire, you're, you're going to get burned. Well, that's a negative example. There are also positive examples. And what you need to see is that everything in your life is going to have consequences. Let, let me give you an example. You may have an extremely high IQ, but you hate mathematics and you hate studying and you hate history and you hate facts and you hate all these things and you don't want to study and you don't apply yourself. That has consequences that even though you have a very high IQ, someone with an IQ much uh, that is, is less than yours will eventually advance beyond you. Our actions, our dispositions, our words, everything have consequences. Now that shouldn't paralyze us with fear, but it should make us be, here's a word, circumspect, to walk with caution, to live with caution, to live wisely, and to realize what I do is going to affect me and others, both in the present and the future. Now, this is what is promised here, that if you hear your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching, they will be like a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. Now, especially you boys, you could sit there and go, I don't want no graceful wreath on my head. I don't need any ornaments around my neck. Well, you're missing the point. Okay? First of all, if you look in Proverbs 4, 9, let's just look over there real quick. It's talking about, about wisdom, and it says she will... Place on your head a garland of grace. She will present you with a crown of beauty. Now, in both these cases, she will adorn your head with what? With grace and beauty. Now, there's another metaphor that we can draw from this reef thing is, is the idea of honor, nobility, victory. That, that what it's saying is if you, if you, by and large, will listen to the biblical instruction... In the loving counsel of your mother and father, it will result that your person, that you yourself will manifest, um, you'll be a person of, of grace, a, a person that is pleasant, a person that others will want to be around. Your personality, your actions, your character will be attractive to other people. And it says, ornaments about your neck. If you look over in Proverbs, let's see, I believe it's chapter 3, verse 22. Um, again, talking about wisdom and discretion. So they will be life to your soul and adornment to your neck. Listen, um, <laughs> I need to be careful how I say this. But we, we all know that, you know, there are, there are differences in, in the way that we look. And, and there are people who you look at them and immediately, you know, you go, wow, they're physically attractive. Whether it's a, a you know, a beautiful, graceful young girl, whether it's a, a strong, athletic young boy or, or, or whatever, everything in between. Um, and and you, they're just born with it. Uh, they're handsome. They're beautiful. And, and we ought to appreciate that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then others of us, you know, weren't that, I guess, um, it didn't turn out the same way. All of us, there are levels of physical beauty. But here's what I want you to see. I have known people in my life who were physically beautiful. I mean, physically beautiful. And you could not stand to be around them. Uh, the Proverbs that we'll study later, it's like a gold ring and a pig's nose. Yeah, they have physical 
beauty and may be very talented, may be very intelligent, but their lack of character, uh, especially their lack of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, of kindness, of goodness, of faithfulness, of gentleness, of self-control, their lack of genuine Christian character made their physical beauty almost grotesque. And then I've met people, both young men and young women, who were just kind of like us, or at least like me, just normal, you see? Not going to stand out in a crowd or anything, but because of their virtue, because of their character, they had a beauty about them, an attractiveness about them. You, you literally wanted to be around them because of who they were inside. Now, I know that's a cliche, you know. It's not who you are on the outside, but who you are on the inside. That's not necessarily true because who you are on the inside will affect who you are on the outside. But I have seen people with the character, Christ-like character, Christ-like virtue, with the fruit of the Spirit that I just quoted, but let's do it again. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And, and they're just beautiful. Even at 90 years old, they're just beautiful. And, and, that, and that's what it's talking about here. It really is. And I want you to see that. I want you to see how important it is. Now, how does this character, this kind of character develop? Um, it, it's not like a crash course that you take. Um, you know, even with an athlete, a great athlete, they don't just do one thing at one time and then all of a sudden they, they jump into, you know, this uh, unusual category of great athleticism. What happens is when you see a great athlete or a great singer, um, it is years and years and years of doing small things that all add together to be something great. I was, I was listening to an athlete um, recently, a CrossFit athlete actually, and that's what they said. They said, I have to give 100% in all the areas of my competition, in all the areas of my skill set, because if I give 95% here, that's 5% I've lost. If I give 95% here, it's another 5%, another 5%, another 5%. And it's the kind of, the, the, it, it is the same way um, in, in our walk with, with Christ, in our seeking to be conformed to him. It's doing the little things. You see, first of all, it's recognizing, you know, wisdom wasn't born with me. I, I need to learn wisdom. And where are the fountains of wisdom? Well, the scriptures and, and the, the Bible says also godly parents who've maybe studied the scriptures and know how to understand them and apply them better. Parents who love you. Um, it can also be godly pastors and godly teachers. And, and, and it's listening. It's listening. It's listening and applying and understanding. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Every one of these opportunities, whether it's, it's my mom, my dad, an older sibling who is worthy of respect, a pastor, a teacher in Sunday school or in school where you go, that, that it's an accumulation of things, okay? It's not going to happen in a day, but it happens over the period of your life. That if you will read the scriptures, if you will pray, if you seek to apply what you know, if you sit under godly teaching of, of, of elders, of, of father, of mother, of other people who are worthy of respect, of worthy being listened to, over time you do these little things, then yes, you will change and you will grow. And before you know it, you'll be coming more and more like Christ. And that, after all, that's the goal. That is the goal. Now let's just recap really quick. Hear your father's instruction. And that includes uh, all those different, not, not just his teaching, but the rules in the house, the duties that have been given to you that will in time create character. Do you see that? And then do not neglect. You know, when mom is trying to 
give you wisdom. <laughs> Don't sit there and go, yeah, 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 I know. You know what? Even if you do know, show respect. Show respect. And God will honor it. But I can assure you, you probably don't know. So do not abandon or forsake your mother's law. Do not fail to listen to your father's instruction. And maybe we'll get to this in time. You know, in the Decalogue, Decalogue, that's a big word. That's the Ten Commandments. Um, it's, Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, talking about Exodus 20, he says, the command to honor your father and your mother, it's the first commandment with a promise in which God actually is telling us, I will bless you if you will honor, if you will obey your father and your mother. I will see. He's the God who sees and I will order your life accordingly. So this is a very, very important teaching. And um, in our next study, what we're going to do is actually, this is for you kids, but also I want your mom and dad present because we're going to talk about, we're actually going to leave Proverbs for a while, maybe one lesson or who knows two. And we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter six, and we're going to talk about teaching in the home. And it's for mom and dad, but it's also for you kids to know that this is one very important aspect of you growing to be everything that you can be inside the will of God in Christ. God bless you.